So when we admit a new patient into the um, hospital, we have them fill out a new client form. Um, and this form just kind of has all of the client's information on it, all of the pet's information on it, the breed, the species, colors, date of birth, um, and then obviously their address, uh, their phone number, email address, um, all of that stuff. So they would fill that out. We would then put it into our computer and make their own, make them a chart. Normal patients who come in and get admitted into the hospital for any kind of reason, for sick, surgery, things like that, um, we always print out a what's called a walk sheet, and I'm sure that other hospitals have these as well. Um, and so this walk sheet really just gives us all of the information here at the top. This is all the information on the patient up here. So this is gonna be our signal mint. Now, Archie Jordan came in today for a dental. Uh, our signal mint here, or a terrier mix, terrier mix canine, um, white and brindle, neutered male. Our birthday is uh, 12207, which makes us 10 years old. Um, and as far as any medical problems, that doesn't that isn't usually stated here on the um, walk sheet, unless they're coming in for a medical problem, like they're throwing up or they're trying to work up their diabetes or something like that. That would be listed underneath the appointment. But if there's any alerts as far as pre-existing medical conditions, medications that they're not allowed to use, it will. Um, we put it in an alert that pops up as soon as you open their account. So I'm actually in Archie Jordan's account right now. And as you can see, there is a little alert that says no child proof lids. Now that's obviously not a medical alert, but that's what a medical alert would look like if it said, um, something along those lines. Obviously this client is probably a little bit older and has a hard time opening um, the, med the medicine containers, um, but that's how I would admit a patient. All of the medical records here at the hospital are kept in Avamark and this holds all of our previous patient information. Um, any kind of forms that we may have gotten from previous vet hospitals that they were that they used to go to um, any kind of medical forms it's all stored under avamark so i'm just going to kind of go through some of this stuff with you so here is our basically their main medical chart that they have with us and this goes back all the way to the first time that they came to the hospital um, for whatever reason over here we have our reminders. So the, this is gonna be the portion that we look at to see um, if our rabies vaccine is due. This will tell us when our heartworm test is due. We um, do intestinal parasite screenings. We, you know, routinely this will remind the owners and us when that's due. Uh, so basically any kind of vaccine that they get that they need to continue to boost after a few years. A lot of times you'll see rattlesnake vaccines. Rattlesnakes are a big thing here. Um, Bordetella vaccines, things like that would all pop up right here and this would be where it would remind us of that when they came in for an appointment. Or if they're coming up due on it, then it'll also give us a reminder and it sends out a little postcard to the, um, to the client. So now if we go in here and the client requests to get some, pay some um, records, we have a little spot here, uh, it says view chart. So basically you just hit this, well, for some reason it's not working on this patient, but you would just hit that button and it would pop up with all of the medical records listed and then you can print that um, or fax it to another vet hospital if they decide that they're gonna go somewhere else. Um, and this is really where we store all of their information. So we can come in here, there's a way that we can look um, at our vaccine history. So this will pop up if we have any past vaccines that we want to say that we gave. This will put it in there and give us our reminders. Um, we can look up all of our weight history since we've been here and the dates that they've been here. Um, really any information that you can think of in here um, we have. So that is how we keep the patient records here at the hospital. At the hospital, we have several different um, estimates that we have to put together in the computer system. And these also serve as consent forms to either sedate or use anesthesia on. Um, so I'm gonna go over one of these like I would with a, with a client. 
So this is just a really generic um, dental estimate. So I would go in the room, talk to the patient, and then I'd go down the list of this. Um, this top part just says, I am the owner's name uh, of the pet, and I am consenting to all of this. Uh, so first part on here is the pre-surgical exam. That's just the doctor listening to the heart, the lungs, checking out everything, making sure it all looks good. Uh, we always run a preoperative blood panel before the dentals. Um, and this will just help us determine if there's any pre-existing conditions that um, we may not have known about that could interfere with anesthesia. Uh, we'll be giving intraoperative fluids during the procedure. Anesthesia with monitoring, uh, that covers all of the medi medications that we use to induce. Um, that'll cover any kind of antibiotics, things like that. Canine dental scaling and polishing, so that's going to be cleaning up the teeth. And that is the dental package, um, which we have over here, the one price. Now if we get in and we do have some bad teeth that we need to pull, if there's any broken ones, ones that are really loose, we like to take those out. Um, on this estimate, we do have up to four extraction units, and each extraction unit is per 15 minutes of extraction time, not per tooth. Uh, we have sent home medications on there, uh, pain medications, antibiotics, um, anti-inflammatories would all be sent home if the patient were to have a tooth taken out. We have dental radiographs on there, which we do like to take pictures of if there's any missing teeth. Um, if we pull any teeth, we always take radiographs to make sure that there's no root left behind um, and nothing funky's going on underneath the gum line. And then this injection here, that's going to, uh, if we do pull any teeth, we will give an antibiotic injection. Um, and that way we can just knock out any bacteria before it can cause any problems. Now moving down here. Um, this part right here is stating that I authorize uh, the appropriate anesthesia to be given. Um, this is kind of our do not resuscitate, resuscitate policy. And generally for clients, I'll tell them, um, this is more of a question for dogs that have pre-existing conditions that might, that might lead to issues with anesthesia. So I generally will tell people just to mark yes, unless they have other wishes. Uh, down here we have consent for extraction. So um, we've run into issues with owners not wanting certain teeth extracted uh, at, when we were doing procedures. So we put this on here as a little extra measure. And the owner can either say that, yes, I do want a phone call before any teeth are extracted, or no, do not call me. Um, I authorize any extractions that the doctor may want. Um, down here, if we can't, if they don't answer the phone when we do call them, they can either say, go ahead with the extraction if we can't get a hold of me, or don't go ahead with the extraction. Uh, down here, it's just saying I understand that if I don't pay this bill in full, there will be interest charged. Um, and then we have, I accept the terms of this treatment, tr treatment plan and then sign the name down there. So that is our consent form. So whenever a patient is admitted into the hospital and it's going to be here for any longer than five minutes in the back, um, there are certain forms that we absolutely require them to have on their cage, on their neck, um, just so that we can ensure that we are never getting any patients confused, um, procedures are being done exactly on the patients that they're supposed to be done on. So I'm going to kind of go over a laboratory form that we would use here um, at the hospital. We pretty much send everything out to IDEX uh, and it is a mostly paperless hospital. So we use Avamark to generate these requisitions that we um, have for the patients. So this is going to be a little example of one of our laboratory forms. So if a patient comes in and it's losing weight or it's gaining weight or it's having, you know, a lot of issues eating, if it's older and it's just preventative, um, we'll usually send out a senior, what we call a senior blood panel. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily need to be sent out on a senior patient, but that's just what we call it. Um, so a senior profile, we'll go ahead and make the charge in Avamark. Um, and it'll pop up and it'll ask you questions about the requisition. Um, it'll ask you your method of collecting urine. Um, and we pretty much always use cystocentesis here at the hospital. Um, and you'll just fill out those forms. There'll be a space where you can put any kind of history that you might want to include for the laboratory. And this is what the requisition is going to look like. We'll print this out. Um, we have three tubes that we send out. We'll, have, we'll get a red top tube and spin it down for the serum, put it in a, in a um, white top tube. 
We'll put the urine in a white top tube and then we'll have an EDTA tube um, as well that we'll send out, make sure that they're labeled correctly. Um, and then the requisition is stuck in the bag before um, the IDEX person comes and picks it up. So that is a little laboratory uh, form that we would use. All right, I'm gonna walk you through uh, an anesthesia report form uh, that we have here at the hospital. They are all electronic online. Pretty much everything we do is um, on the computer. We're almost a paperless hospital, uh, but this is what we would fill out for any surgery that we're doing, any kind of anesthesia. We use it for sedations, things like that. So we have our client here. Um, we have our anesthesia surgery report highlighted and then we open up the form. So this looks exactly the same for every procedure we do. Um, uh, these boxes are all blank, obviously we fill them out. So this is one of my dog's anesthesia reports. Uh, he got a TPLO done last year. So under procedure, obviously we list our procedure. We put the initials of the doctor that's um, doing the procedure and then the technician that's overseeing it. Any medications that we use, they get um, recorded under here. So these are our pre-anesthetic drugs that we generally use and those go by weight. We use different ones for different weights of dogs or cats. Um, and then this is our induction little list that we usually use. So we will write down whatever induction agents we use. Um, and then you continue to go down and you just fill out everything. So we use isofluorine. We use the size 11 tube. Um, monitoring we list everything the people who monitored that surgery um, the size catheter that we use the rate of the fluids this uh, particular procedure we had fentanyl we had a fentanyl drip going and then we'll have our post induction stuff so our heart rate you know our toenail trims stating that all the, the ears are great everything um, under notes, we would put any kind of antibiotics we gave, any kind of post-op pain meds, um, post-op anti-inflammatories. Anti we have this part right here kind of talks about um, the pre-stuff, so when we take the temperature in the room, the doctor listens to the heart rate, um, does their examination. This is the written up portion of the surgery. A lot of times we'll just copy and paste out of a glossary that we have for the surgeries. Uh, this here is our times that we started and stopped the surgery. We, we have a digital recorder on all of our anesthetic machines. However, if we were manually recording this, these would be all of the items that we would be recording, and this is where we would put it. And then at the very bottom, we put whatever medications are going home. We put their SIG and how many, how many are going. So that is an anesthesia form. At the hospital, we have pre-generated discharge instructions um, in the computer. Uh, once in a while, you'll have to make, if it's just like an oddball thing, we're removing a growth from somewhere, we'll um, make our own. There's a form, but you can fill out your own stuff. The uh, go-home discharge instructions that I'm going to show you today are really generic, already in the computer, um, dental discharge instructions. So these are the discharge instructions. And all of them look pretty similar. This is for a dental procedure. And I'm going to kind of go over this like I would with a client. So the first part on here talks about food and water. Um, and the fact that we have been fasted all day for the anesthesia and we've been on anesthesia does mean that our stomach's going to be a little bit sensitive. So I tell people to usually give about half of what you normally would for dinner a couple hours after the procedure just to offer to have something in the stomach. Um, if we do throw that up tonight, that would be a totally normal uh, response after anesthesia. So if we throw up, don't feed any more food until tomorrow morning. Uh, it's going to be the same deal with the water. So if you have the water on the ground, just really re watch how much we're drinking. If we just sit there and we want to lap it up, um, pull it away, let them take a breather. Don't let them drink too much because that will upset their stomach and make them vomit. Tomorrow morning after we sleep off the anesthesia, we're going to be totally fine to eat our normal diet. Um, this part right here, if any if there had been any extractions, it would say feed soft food for, you know, three to five days, five to seven days, things like that. This particular dog did not have any extractions today. Um, and because it had no extractions, we're not sending it home with any medications, and it also didn't get any injections. Um, down here, 
our discharge instructions tell us uh, the periodontitis, and this is a grade three out of four. And usually what I'll tell clients is um, a lot of times dogs or cats do have pretty bad gum uh, dental disease. So it's pretty normal when we see those um, advanced uh, dental issues. Um, and then at that point, I would generally let them know that um, it's probably good to start them on some kind of dental chew at home. So then moving down the list, uh, calculi severe, so that's the brown tartar that builds up. Staining is severe, uh, so that just means they're not pearly white anymore. Uh, there were zero extractions, 23 were missing when we... And then down here at the bottom, we do have detailed brushing instructions if people are interested in trying to do that. And that is how I would um, go ahead and discharge a patient to a client. One of the unique forms that's used in my hospital probably used in a couple other hospitals, um, is our treatment sheets. Um, pretty much these are all on the patient record on the computer as well. Uh, and it's, it's a really awesome tool. So in all of these boxes, uh, we can put the treatments that they need to get and whenever they're administered. Um, there's also spots for the TPR that we do. Um, generally, we always do a TPR in the morning when we first come in. So this has a spot for that. It has a spot for the amount of fluids that have been administered throughout the night or the day or the patient's entire time being there. Um, here at the bottom, we have a spot for notes. If a uh, if, uh, Care or a kennel kid takes a dog out for a walk and they have diarrhea, they can note that there. Um, there's slots that talk about food and water and if they have a clean kennel, things like that, and everything gets initialed. Um, these are really awesome because then you just scan them into the computer system at night and you can attach it and you can see everything um, that that patient got done on that day at any point if you wanted to look up a year ago when they spent a night at the hospital, everything would be recorded on that sheet. Try and get the dog in there. <laughs> so I'm going to take the dog out of the cage safely. Sometimes they like to jump, so I like to keep them just like so. So taking them out and then putting them back in. Make sure we don't jump back out. And there's that. Well, that's good that we left this on the counter all day yesterday. What are you going to do about that? Does anybody want to produce the volume? I think she has a baby water. Um. So I'm going to properly put a muzzle on. Clarabelle never would need a muzzle, but I'm going to use her to demonstrate. So we're going to find a muzzle that fits properly around the, no the nose. Um, we also want to make sure that they can't open their mouth too much, but they can still breathe with it on. So uh, a lot of times this becomes really difficult when you have really bad dogs. Uh, so the method that I usually like to use is to grasp the muzzle and then just kind of slip it over the nose really quickly and underneath, and then you can clip it in the back. You're going to tighten it so that they can't get it, and that's how you do it. All right, we're doing a physical examination on a dog. Um, there's a couple things we're going to want to look at. So very first things, uh, I like to start here and work my way down. So we're going to look at our eyes, our ears, and our nose. Um, and that's just going to check for the dental disease, see how our eyes are doing, see if there's anything in the ears, especially this time of year, fox scales are really awful. Um, we'll come down here, kind of assessing the animal. This is when we're going to get our heart rate, our respiration. Um, you are going to want to listen to the lungs, the heart, how they're all going. Um, we're going to get our heart rate by counting the beats per minute that we can feel uh, for six seconds and then we just put a zero at the end of it. So if we can feel 12 beats, um, that's 120 beats a minute. And then it's going to be the same deal for the um, respiration. Uh, Claire is very worked up right now because she's nervous, so she's, not, uh, she's probably going to have a very high respiration. Um, we'll come down here to the back end. We'll just check for any kind of lumps. See how our joints are moving, how everything looks, uh, if anything's painful, if anything looks weird. Um, and then getting a temperature is also part of the physical examination. Uh, so that would be one of the TPR criteria as well. Clara Bell is going to get the ASA grade uh, class one. Girls, can I see these girls? Oh, you want to see the girls? Yeah. Hi. 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 Hi
Okay, go. In order to ensure that a patient is going to be completely healthy under anesthesia, there are minimum databases that are very important to get before any kind of procedure is done. The first one is going to be the patient history. Um, so the signalment of the patient, any pre-existing conditions, um, any kind of procedures that it's had done in the past, all of these things are going to be pretty important before um, an anesthetic procedure is performed. Um, another database that's really important is a physical exam and just to make sure that everything internally and externally looks normal, looks and feels normal and is functioning properly. Um, we always do, even if their last exam was only a few days before the surgery, the doctors at my practice will always do a pre-surgical exam uh, just to make sure that nothing weird has popped up or something they missed previously is there. Um, there's also the pre-anesthetic blood panels that we like to run, which is ge a general basic database. At my practice, we generally will run urine, um, we'll run a CBC, and then we'll also use a ke a Chem 10, which checks all kinds of glucose, um, BUN, creatinine, all kinds of things just to make sure that nothing um, as far as that goes is weird or anything like that. So those are the minimum databases. So if we're doing a physical examination on a patient and we do find any kind of abnormalities in that examination, uh, things like growths that we find, um, heart murmurs can be something that you'll, that'll be a little funky that you might find on a physical examination. Um, if the body score is really low, really skinny, things like that are going on, uh, we do usually recommend doing additional testing to see what's going on there. So for a heart murmur, um, a lot of times we would take x-rays of the heart just to see if it's enlarged. Um, and that also kind of gives us a broad, like a borderline of how big it is now. And so if they come back in later on, um, we'll be able to take more x-rays and see how much bigger the heart has gotten or if it's stayed the same or how we're progressing in that way. Um, also with heart murmurs, if they're bad enough, a lot of times the doctor will recommend doing an ECG, which we do here um, at the hospital. Um, so we have the ECG. We also have echocardiograms that we do here uh, at the hospital for heart patients. Uh, lab work we would also do if we found anything weird. If we found weird lumps, we might do some lab work just to see how our levels are. Um, weird lumps that we might find do find needle aspirates on to see what kind of cells are inside of it. If they are suspicious cells, we might take x-rays of the chest um, to see if anything spread. Um, yeah, there's some additional databases. So on the topic of a pre-anesthetic post-anesthetic um, procedure uh, for pain management. So I'm going to talk about uh, TPLO surgery, which is an orthopedic surgery. Um, before the surgery, and this happens with almost every single surgery we have, uh, we're going to give some kind of pain medication um, as a pre-anesthetic, and that goes by weight. So bigger dogs will get hydromorphine, and that's something that they'll get, pre uh, get as a pre-med. Um, and then smaller dogs will usually get buprenorphine first before um, anesthesia. And so we give that, that kind of uh, starts out our pain regimen uh, 
effectiveness. And then during an orthopedic surgery, generally we will be doing the surgery while the patient is on a fentanyl drip. And that really helps with the pain management. That also helps us control the anesthesia a little bit better when they're on the fentanyl. Um, they get to be kept at a much lower level of ISO, um, which is better for every pretty much everything going on. Post, uh, post-operative, so we'll usually give hydromorphine once they wake up again, um, I am, and then they'll be kept on their fentanyl drip through the night, uh, and that just really keeps them comfortable. And then the next day, we'll usually give a tramadol an hour before we take them off of their fentanyl so that they have some kind of relief when they do finally come off of that. Um, so... Also, not pain-related, but we always, with our pre-meds, we'll always do either glyco or we'll use some atropine to pre-med, and that, again, just depends on the weight of the dog, whether or not we use glyco or atropine. Um, so that is pretty much our, that's our anesthetic protocol that we do there at the hospital, and we do the same thing for everybody unless some kind of condition is happening where the doctor wants us to do something different. In addition to making a pre-anesthetic plan, um, as far as medications go to help with pain management, it's very important to run blood work before we do anesthesia on any patient. So preoperative blood panels um, are going to be a very important part of the pre-anesthetic protocol. So as far as our controlled drug log goes, we actually have a very convenient system here. We don't have an actual written down drug log, which I know a lot of hospitals do. You'll put in whatever patient um, gets the controlled drug and how much they get of it, and you write that down every day. Here at uh, my hospital, we just record it in the patient's record, um, and that would be how we would log it. So I'm just gonna do a little quick demonstration of that here. Um, so again, on my account, my dog, when he got this TPLO surgery, he had a bunch of tramadol. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make a little new item here. Um, and we'll use tramadol since that's a medication that we send out a lot. So we just put in our tramadol, make sure that we're looking at the proper strength of it. Double click on that. And then however many tablets we're sending home. So uh, usually for normal surgeries, we'll do four days of you know outpatient pain medication. So say that that's twice a day, we'll do eight. Um, and this is just kind of a loose demonstration. Uh, and then we it pops up with our um, label. So depending on the size of the dog and the dose of the medication and um, all of that stuff will determine what our label is going to say. So if we do one tablet three times a day, which would be the proper dose for my dog um, and the size that he is, uh, this would be our label. And then as soon as you hit print here, which I'm not going to do just because I'm not um, actually filling any medications, it would print out my drug label. And then that also would be uh, the log. So it would take it out of inventory here at the hospital and it would be our controlled drug log for if anybody came to audit us or anything like that. Okay, so this is an anesthetic machine out here at the hospital. Um, so starting out, very first thing, um, our oxygen is actually hooked to a big tank that is outside of the um, hospital. But so the oxygen is plugged into the wall right here. It comes up and goes into um, this part of the machine, which is the flow meter. This will determine how much oxygen is flowing into the machine at any time. Um, we'll come down here to um, our vaporizer. So this has our isofluorine inside of it. Um, this will also give us control of the level of isofluorine that we're using. Um, and it vaporizes the iso. Uh, it takes the iso down into the fresh gas outlet, uh, which comes in here into our inhale part of the um, anesthetic machine. This is where the tube is gonna be hooked up. This is what the patient breathes in, this has the oxygen and the, oxygen and the ISO in it. Um, when the patient breathes back out, it all comes back through here and into the um, outlet. This part is connected to the scavenging system, which goes outside of the hospital. We don't have a tank that it goes into. Um, and then we have carboline. 
So all of the um, oxygen and ISO goes through this and it kind of filters out um, the CO2 and everything like that. Um, so we have bags that we put on here in different sizes depending on how big the patient is. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to use a one. And it goes here. And then it fills up with air and ISO. We're going to flush it with the flush valve right here. This is going to be a pressure check. Right here is our pressure um, relief chamber. So if I want to give a patient a breath, I can either close it all the way, but we don't usually do that here because we do have the button that closes it. Now when I do the pressure check, I'm going to hold off um, the tube, and then I'm going to hold off the relief valve, and I'm going to push on the bag. And as long as that bag is holding pressure on the pressure gauge, then it shows us that the machine is working properly. So this is this tube. Now if we go to the non-rebreather, the non-rebreather is made for smaller patients.
tape. So we'll put our first tape on. Then we're going to take our tea porch and attach that. Finish on it, put tape on it. place a catheter so we can administer our induction drug. Shave a little spot here. And then we're going to scrub it three times. Moving on. Crisis averted. Shh. Sorry. <laughs> what? Secure our catheter. All right, and the induction drug we're using today is called Alfaxin. Go. All right, we're going to start pushing the Yeah. And we just use it to affect. That one girl's mom. Oh, it's too gay. What? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Shut it. And then put it on 120. 
Okay, I'm going to give a sub-Q injection. So we're going to lift up the skin. This is a new needle. Pull back to make sure we're not getting any blood. And then inject. drug IM. This is a mixture of hydromorphine and atropine. So we'll find a good muscle for two minutes and then do breaths. Uh, we always want to remember our ABCs of um, an emergency. So airway, breathing, and then circulation. So we'll place a catheter, um, we'll get some fluids running, get some circulation going, and that way we also have venous access in case the heart stops or they stop breathing on their own. Um, we'll intubate the patient usually um, and then start breathing for them if they're not breathing on their own. We also have the Ambu bag here. This attaches to a fresh gas outlet. And then with the Ambu bag, you have the um, mask. You're gonna put that over the nose and then 
It just breathes for the patient and administers oxygen for them. If they're not breathing on their own, this is not as effective. Um, we don't have a patient to demonstrate this on at the moment. Um, so there's Still tied down. There you go. Okay, so hook them up to the right side. First thing, start the oxygen in and so. Okay, so we're gonna secure this guy on the table here. Three and make sure your oxygen's on. Okay, so we're gonna take our little ties and attach them here. Get them nice and tight so that he's not flopping around. reader. Um, you clip this on the tongue or on the dog's tongue or cat's tongue, whichever anesthetized patient you have on the table, um, and it reads the SpO2, so the blood oxygen saturation. Um, the tongue does have to be wet for that to be reading. This is our esophageal stethoscope. So this goes down the esophagus and it measures um, not the dog's temperature and then or cat or the patient's um, heart rate. So that's that, it's down the esophagus. This is the uh, blood pressure cup. This goes on the arm. Um, there are directions on here. You have to place it in a specific spot and make sure that it's tight enough and it's the proper size. And that monitors the blood pressure. It takes it every two minutes on our machine. And then this machine is not actually attached to an ECG reader, but this is what it would look like if it did. These would go <clears throat> behind each elbow and knee, and then it also this would also be reading the um, waves of the heart and giving us our heart rate. So I'm gonna scrub in. Oops, turn our water on here. I already have my cap and mask on. Um, we pull this out. We have a little instrument here that cleans underneath our nails. So we're gonna want to do that really quickly. Get all that dirt out from under there. And I'll get my sponge wet. So when we scrub, we're going to scrub fingers. And then we go from one hand to the other, working up. Okay. Lauren, can you turn me in? Yeah. 
Megan, will you bring that dog up? Yeah, thank you. Started another video. Alright. So now we have our gloves on sterilely. And I'm already for surgery sweep. You can stop recording. I'm recording. Alright, so we're gonna set up our surgical field here. Take our towels and drape them over the incision area. Everything's been covered in that <laughs> So I'm going to discuss the um, duties of a sterile technician and I'm not doing this at the hospital while I was scrubbing in because I was starting to get in the way of the surgery day. Um, my hospital's really busy so that's kind of not allowed. But so the duties of the sterile technician are going to be setting up the sterile field, um, taking instruments from people that are handing them to you sterilely out of sterile pouches or if they're unwrapping certain packs, um, that would be your duty. Assisting the doctor, um, blotting blood, making sure that anything that's outside of the body, organs, skin tissue, things like that, are staying moisturized the way they're supposed to, usually with um, some saline. Um, and just assisting the doctor in whatever he needs. So a lot of times uh, you'll be holding tissue away 
or um, you'll just be holding instruments for him or holding a limb, things like that. So those are the sterile duties. To maintain a sepsis and sterility of the sterile field, um, especially as the technician who's scrubbed in, who's sterile, it's really important to keep everything organized so that we're not scrounging through things to um, find certain instruments. Um, it's important never, obviously, to touch anything that's not sterile. You're always going to want to keep your hands right in front of your chest, not touching your chest, but right in front of them whenever you're not doing anything with them. Um, you're going to want to really be keeping an eye on everybody else in the room as well, that they're not touching or accidentally um, swiping something when they walk by that should be sterile. And immediately if you do notice something like that happening, you have to re-sterilize everything. Um, new pack, if somebody touches something in the pack or something falls in the pack, that's not sterile. Um, and so just keeping a close eye on everything and really being aware of what's going on around you, those are gonna be the most important things as far as keeping things sterile. So after a surgery day, usually the surgery suite is pretty dirty. Um, there have not been any surgeries today, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through the process of cleaning up after um, a surgery day. So you are gonna wanna make sure that all the blood is washed, wiped up, which there's usually quite a bit of. All of these instruments need to be properly cleaned and put away. Um, if the instruments are not put away clean, a lot of times it will affect them and then it work as properly as well. Um, one of the special equipments that we use here is the CO2 monitor. Uh, this does need to be hung up every day after, I believe it's three patients, so that it can dry out, otherwise it will not read properly. Um, it's going to be the same with the tubes. So the tubes need to be hung upside down so that all of the moisture inside of them drains out. Uh, when cleaning up packs, there's usually a couple sharks left in there from the doctors, so needles, scalpels, things like that. You're going to want to take those off and dispose of them into a sharks container immediately so that they don't cause any damage. Uh, we have scrub buckets that we use here in the surgery suite. And at, any, at the end of the day, every single day, these get emptied out and autoclaved, and then they get um, refilled with the proper scrub so that they stay nice and sterile and clean. Um, hazardous material. So the carboline needs to be changed after every surgery day or as soon as it starts to look purple. This carboline is good. It was changed recently, but I'm just going to kind of talk about the steps of doing that. So whenever you change carboline, you are going to want to wear a surgical mask and gloves. You don't want this to make contact with your skin, and you also don't want to breathe this in at any point. You're going to twist it off, um, take the bucket, and we'll dump it inside of a trash can. And then immediately after dumping it into the trash can, we'll fill this, put it back on, take the trash can out to the garbage, not to let it sit, we'll take it to the dumpster immediately. Um, and that's how you would dispose of that. Alright, and that's that. I'm just going to show a couple right now. Okay. Then we'll place them into our ultrasonic machine. Turn it on, and that's going to get all of the debris that we're not able to get rinsing it. After it's done in there, we're going to dump it into the instrument um, uh, lubricant. And then we'll pull it out. Yeah, and those instruments are ready to be put oh, back in the